I'm Dr. Lee Goldstein. I'm an associate professor in psychiatry, neurology, and engineering at Boston University School of Medicine and College of Engineering. Uh, I'm a clinician by training and uh, a psychiatrist. Um, I did geriatric geriatric work um, at Mass General Hospital in the Harvard system before coming over to uh, BU. And I got into this work actually when I was um, uh, recruited across town to uh, Boston University. And BU is now uh, an epicenter for a lot of the work on um, traumatic brain injury um, stemming from sports uh, and also uh, military uh, veterans who've had blast exposure. So we have a large brain bank uh, devoted to the subject and now we have a lot of clinical studies going on as well. And what, what I do has to do with trying to understand what happens in the brain when we see them, uh, when we see people before they uh, die and what are the mechanisms that are happening that we can then try to treat uh, and diagnose um, while people uh, still can benefit. So um, as a clinician, uh, first and foremost, the thing that I always start with is the patient. So even when we're doing experimental work in animals or in a test tube, the thing that's most important, what we're always thinking about, is the patient. It's not really about what's going on in the test tube, it's not really uh, what's going on in, in the animals, it's how, how what we're looking at relates to people. So what I'm going to be presenting uh, here is um, uh, some data uh, related to brains of teenagers um, who have a neurodegenerative disease called chronic traumatic encephalopathy. No one can say that I can't either. It's a little tough, so we just call it CTE. And um, this is a bona fide neurodegenerative disease, um, and it has some features that are similar to Alzheimer's disease, uh, but we're seeing it in um, uh, teenagers, young adults, um, folks in their middle ages when they should have none of this in their heads. And the, and the common feature that drives this is all of these folks um, have had repetitive head injuries of one sort or another and it appears to be strongly associated with the development of, um, of CTE. So we need to understand this because it's so common uh, and it is uh, so damaging uh, to people who are affected. So uh, we're going to be presenting human neuropathological data and then animal models um, in which we can try to understand how this occurred in, in people. So one of the things that's already happened with this, and this really started uh, coming to the fore in the past decade or so, uh, truthfully in the last five to seven years. So what we've already seen is um, an increase in awareness um, that there may be long-term consequences to some of these head injuries. And I find that uh, particularly compelling and important in uh, youth, youth sports particularly. So we already have seen this not only nationally but internationally uh, in a variety of different sports. So one of the, the first things that comes out of this is just an awareness that there's a problem. And that's a really big deal because if we know there's a problem, even if we can't fix it, we can at least try to prevent it. And, and that, that's already occurring. So the, the problem we have there now is understanding that there is a relationship, and it's extremely controversial, as I'm sure most um, uh, folks know, um, is, is this association between um, head injuries and this neurodegenerative disease, um, is it uh, real? And if, if so, what is the mechanism uh, of this association? So, so I think the first question really is just an awareness that uh, it seems to be an increased risk. And the focus of the work right now is showing that they're mechanistically related. A causes B. So um, the controversy is actually one of the most difficult pieces of this. It's a non-scientific problem, actually. It's a public um, uh, relations and public opinion, uh, and, and there's also um, uh, issues around um, who who the stakeholders are. And uh, that's outside of my realm of ex expertise uh, uh, as a scientist, but not a as a citizen and a, and a father, for example. Um, uh, 
it's really quite astounding to me the degree to which even in the scientific community uh, this remains controversial. And so that affects funding, that affects um, uh, the reception of the data, um, it um, uh, shapes the way our results are seen. Uh, both uh, in the scientific field and in the public arena. And uh, my feeling is this is going to take um, more than a generation, uh, just as it has with cigarette smoking and lung cancer, um, asbestos and mesothelioma, um, and, and uh, lead, lead in drinking water, um, fluoride in teeth, that we could go on and on and on. And I think that that's where we are. This is more than just a science problem. I'm hoping like three to five uh, on the shorter end of this. Um, and I'm quite hopeful about this because really in a short period of time, uh, it seems to me, and I think it's generally appreciated, uh, that uh, we, we've moved the dial quite a bit. There's quite a bit of awareness about this. Um, uh, not only are um, parents concerned, but uh, uh, pe uh, community leaders are concerned, politicians are concerned, um, our military leaders are concerned about this, um, and um, I think that's all a good thing. So. I think over the next three to five years, as we learn more about the mechanism, I'm quite hopeful, uh, because I, we're doing some of this work, uh, that, that we'll have not only um, a way to diagnose this in living people, but actually uh, real treatments. This, I really see, is something that we can do in, in the next three to five years. Um, and that's with the growing awareness as well. Um, this is a disease of younger people, um, when people are mostly healthy. Um, we are, have already developed ways to stop the process in its track. And um, we're confident that we can move those into, tra into a translational realm that we can eventually get into people, hopefully sooner rather than later. And the benefit of this is that if we understand this disease, um, the relationship to Alzheimer's, which is a much harder disease in my opinion to solve, I think we'll have a real inroad not only on CTE but also on Alzheimer's. that's most gratifying about this is knowing that um, people who are at risk and um, uh, uh, who are desperately looking for help are, are now having hope and, um, uh, and I think with good reason and that's actually tremendously gratifying not only as a scientist but also as a clinician and also as a parent and as a citizen. Um, uh, th this affects large swaths of, our, of, our, of um, uh, nearly every nation on the planet. It's one of the leading causes of death and disability around the world. And and sadly, it frequently affects um, people in their younger in their younger years, and uh, the uh, the cost to society, to families, to individuals is just um, uh, is just overwhelming. So it's, it's very gratifying to know that we're now understanding parts of this that we hadn't in the past, and I have great confidence that we're going to be able to make a, a real impact uh, in the relatively short uh, short term for the future.